Um, how do you come to this? We talked about that on the phone last week. Just a brief thumbnail on that. And this, by this, do you mean the work that you do? How is it that your passion, your interest, your personal learning brings you to a unique perspective on what's what's the difficulties associated with learning to read and what you're doing about it? Um, Pat's story is different than mine. I understand. Hers comes from speech, right. from the field of speech, and so it's heavily into phoneme awareness and its relationship to speech. And I think she made a significant contribution. Mine uh, is from reading. My uh, post degree, my master's degree is in reading, and I had been working with Pat um, on phoneme awareness and articulatory feedback when I was getting my master's degree. And at that time, the feeling was, I think I may have said this to you on the phone, but at, at that time, when I was getting my master's degree, the, the feeling was that reading was a contextual guessing game. And they d were not giving credibility or even a thought to the importance of decoding a word on the page. And so I had already um, been thinking that reading was more than just sounding out words because I'd seen a lot of students that we had made a difference for in developing their phoneme awareness. But I also saw students that their word recognition and their ability to read in the page wasn't changing as rapidly as their word attack skills were. And so when I was getting my master's, I was arguing about the importance of decoding a word and the importance of sound-symbol relationships and um, fighting them tooth and nail on reading in, the, reading in context was the only thing that was important. And out of the master's degree in that fight, I developed a sort of a holistic view of reading which is the Venn diagram that we always talk about. And if I had a board here, I could go to it. And it's that there are circles that um, overlap. And one of them is word attack. And one of them is word recognition. And one of them is reading in context. And around all of that is the ability to comprehend. And that's a very global, big view of reading, as opposed to what I think we have now, which is we've gone away from whole language. And now we're on the only thing you do is teach students to sound out a word. And so really, I think that my contribution has been um, that big view of reading, so that we don't get lost in one piece of reading, that we see that reading is all of those. And in fact, um, good word attack skills may not end up giving you what you want in reading. They may not be the only piece that you need for developing the ability to read fast on the page fluency. And they may not, for sure, they may not give you the ability to comprehend. And so I worked with a lot of students um, over the years. A lot when I, was, when I met Pat, um, a lot before I met Pat, a lot we worked on together. And there are a lot of stories out there, the students that uh, drove the bus for me to try to make a difference. The times I, I came back and cried because I was in an environment where when I was getting my master's and I had all of this um, experience teaching students to sound out words, uh, I was now up against a camp that thought that that was nonsense. And it occurred to me that really they were partially right and we were partially right, and that really the whole thing needed to be looked at in a bigger uh, perspective. And I think that that's one contribution in my history with Pat. And the second one is developing Linda Mood Bell. When she and I came together to develop Linda Mood Bell, it was really important to me that we put together an organization that could make a contribution. And that couldn't just be mom and pop, it couldn't just be Pat and me and a few other people, that we really had to develop what you see here. And it's an organization of more than a thousand employees and an infrastructure that we put together that I think if we hadn't done that, we would have just been another program on the shelf. And so the other contribution, I think, uh, is asking questions of myself and the students I worked with to try to fit the pieces into that puzzle, those circles of word attack, word recognition, contextual reading, and comprehension. If we had this one figured out, what did we have to do to figure out the rest of them? Because we couldn't just keep turning students out that we would improve from like a first grade level to a 10th grade level in word attack. 
but their word recognition was still at a third grade level, and so there was a gap between what they could sound out and what they could recognize in terms of real words. And then there was a huge gap between what they could do when they were on the page. And so I began to analyze, and I think as Pat did when she was developing the LIPS program, what is it I do when I'm reading? Um, so from the perspective of comprehension, I continue to see students, David, that could not comprehend, but they could decode anything. They could do our colored blocks, they could tell you sounds and letters and words, but ask them to comprehend what they read, and even if they were accurate reading the words, it didn't do any good. And now we know that those students can be called hyperlexic versus dyslexic. In other words, they have difficulty getting the words off the page over here, but they have difficulty getting the meaning off the page in this side, and it's like a two-sided coin. Um, and so I began to ask myself, what on earth is it that I do, and what do other people do if they comprehend well? And uh, one day I was working with a college student who we developed the, his word attack skills, and his spelling was getting better. He could hear sounds and words, perceive sounds and words. and. I said to him, read this and tell me what it's, what, the mean, what it's about, and he said, okay, and he read it and gave me an unbelievable summary. And I said, Alan, how is it you can do that? I mean, that was great comprehension. And he said, I just make movies when I read. And I said, what do you do? And this was years ago, this was in the 80s, and I said, what do you do? And he said, I make movies when I read. I said, do you see things? And he said, yeah, I just everything, everything I read turns into a movie. I just see it all up here. And I can tell you everything about it, and you can ask me questions, and I did, and he had the whole thing. Not only pictured, but he could do inferential thinking, etc. And he said to me, sort of nervously, sort of positioned himself, he said, doesn't everybody do that? Thinking that he was, that there was again something wrong with him, because he had been dyslexic. And now it looked as if I was questioning his ability to comprehend. And, uh, I said, no, I don't know if everybody does that, but I am going to find out. And so I did a lot of research on the relationship between imaging and comprehension, and there was not very much out there. So then I decided to ask people that I knew, like, for example, do you visualize when you read? And yes, I do, and I can do it very fast. Or the people that said that they didn't visualize also said that they also didn't have great comprehension. And I realized that people got parts of what they read not the gestalt. And so those same children or adults could remember a fact, remember a bit or a piece, but they can't answer a main idea question. They can't draw a conclusion. They can't make an inference because they have this weakness in their sensory system, back to a sensory connection, in comprehending. And I've done a lot of research on it now, and published a lot on it, and spoken a lot on it, and it appears that it is a major, a major sensory factor in being able to comprehend. And when you start thinking about that, David, then you realize that in society we have children who are possibly not learning to visualize because they're watching TV and the images are made for them. They're possibly doing video games, and their eye-hand coordination is getting good, but their mental representations for concepts is not. So that was a, a big aha for me. And so we began, I wrote a program, we began to uh, do research on that. Our recent research in Pueblo, Colorado, where we use the visualizing and verbalizing program, that's what we do to teach concept imagery, um, has produced significant gains in reading comprehension. So we've got some good longitudinal data now, it's about to be published, and I'm really excited about that. So then I began to ask myself, if imaging, if you can image concepts, how is that different from imaging letters and words? And so the same student, this was really years ago, the same student that I had said, Alan, the college student, how do you remember what you read? Um, I couldn't get him to spell accurately. I could get him to spell phonetically. This is really important, but I couldn't get him to spell accurately. His orthographic processing was not intact as it needed to be. Um, even though his word attack skills were now really high, his phoneme awareness was well developed, when he would spell opportunity, for example, now he could spell it O-P-E-R-T-U-N-I-T-Y. 
and not know that it had two P's and had an O in there. He could just do it phonetically. And so I said to him, Alan, if you can, if you can visualize all those wonderful things, can you see the letters in a word? And uh, he said, I don't know what you mean. And I said, if I give you a word, like we're working on the word opportunity, can you see those letters in your mind? Because you've just written it a couple of times. And he said, I have no idea what you're talking about. Now, mind you, this is someone that had just told me all the movies that he had going on up here. And so I thought, well, I've started with too long of a word. And I said, let's shorten the word. And so I did a word like enough, thinking that it was strange enough that he, maybe he had that pictured. And don't you have it pictured? Like, what's the second letter in enough? You can tell me that, because you can see it quickly. Um, I said that to him, and he said, I have no idea. I can't see those. I can't see any letters. He said, you see letters? And I said, yeah, I see letters. I can see letters. I can take those the sounds and put them to letters. And so then I said, how about the word cat? Can you see the letters in cat? Can you visualize that? And he looked me straight in the eye, and he said, I can't see a thing. He said, I can only see a cat, and I can make it a red cat. I can make it a striped cat. I can put the cat in the kitchen. I can do anything you want with that cat, but I can't, I can't see any letters. I said, what? Are you kidding me? You can't see those letters? He said, no, I can't. So it, it occurred to me then, and, it, and I sat on it for years and years, that there was some relationship between phoneme awareness and symbol imagery, being able to create mental representations for letters and sounds and words. And I think that it's, we've got a test for it now, and the, what we're showing is that it is highly, and I mean highly correlated to phoneme awareness and reading and spelling. It's, it's highly correlated. And that makes sense because when we read and spell, we read and spell with symbols. And you have to do more than just be able to perceive the sounds. In my opinion, you have to be able to take those sounds and, in your sensory system, attach them and hold them to letters from vowel consonant to consonant vowel all the way through. And the students that we see now that we directly and explicitly develop symbol imagery with are getting um, better gains than what we had done before because we're starting to fill in the circles. We used to fill in mostly a word attack circle and some a word recognition circle. We're starting now to fill in more circles. So I hope that one of the things that Linda Mood Bell brings to the whole field of reading is that um, reading is more than just one process. It's, it's a number of processes, but it's not a hundred of them. It's only a few. So it's still not, it's not as complicated as we make it seem, in my opinion. And though there's these concurrent processes, and each one of those, there's concurrent processes, yes. and all these things are but, but it's relating. A, right, and it's an integration. I think that we we get lost in, in our field in thinking that it's one thing, and we look for a silver bullet. And in fact, I was just talking with Don Hamill from ProEd, and he sent me an article that he'd written just recently. It's a, in this month's issue of, uh, gosh, I'm not sure, but you could find out. And it's called the correlates of reading. And the correlates of reading that he says are the most significant are not phoneme awareness and rapid automatized naming. Now that's a big thing that's going to hit the field. And he's saying that we've rushed to, to make phoneme awareness and speech the biggest factors. And I said, Don, the thing is it's an integration. It's, that doesn't mean that phoneme awareness and our tick feedback aren't important. It just means they're part of a whole. And, he, and so we were passionately talking about, about the code, the importance of breaking the code. It, it's more than just one thing. I use the analogy of a, a player piano. Mm. That if, you don't, if, if, there isn't, if the keys aren't functioning and there isn't enough distinct sounds, mm -hmm. then the, the player scroll mm -hmm. can't produce mm -hmm. coherent mm -hmm. sounds. Mm -hmm. If the keys can't be played fast enough together in chords, mm -hmm. It can't produce the right sounds. As right. Well. So there's this code, but the code has to play this this virtual assembly system inside of us, and that uh, phonemic awareness piece is just the piece about the distinctions in sound. It doesn't necessarily cross across all the other layers. It. But and the thing is, it could, if we explicitly and directly connect it to 
in my opinion, symbol imagery, at least more into print. Well, I think. What you said about symbol imagery and its connection to phonemic awareness is that, I mean, I think generally everybody agrees. We wouldn't, <clears throat> the kind of phonemic awareness that we need in order to uh, make distinctions in sound as we hear it and engage in speech is of an entirely different resolution level mm -hmm. than the level that we have to have in order to engage in print. Mm -hmm. In order to engage in print, it actually is the symbol that has to pull the sound together. And, and that's, and I think one of the things that we're finding, I agree with you, and one of the things that we're finding is that now that we're saying um, we're integrating Arctic feedback in the LIPS program, auditory processing, and imagery, we're making this integration in the sensory system, and we're doing it directly. We're asking the student questions, what, it, what are you feeling in your mouth? What letters are you perceiving? What's the second letter? If I say plift, what's the second letter that you picture? Can you say the letters backwards to me? We're asking for all that sensory system to connect. And I think that by doing that, we're getting um, phonological processing better developed and orthographic processing. I think the piece that, we're, that I'm wanting to talk about is that if you talk about orthographic processing, it doesn't mean that you're doing a look-say program. It doesn't mean it's C-spot run. Doesn't mean it's I'm going to hold up, look, and take it away and have you memorize it. To, to be able to say that you're working on both phonological and orthographic means that you're integrating those two, that you recognize that reading is, it has letters, and you have to, you have to integrate the two. And I think that, therefore, um, some of the whole language people were right in that one piece, that you did have to get students on the page. And a long time ago, Phonics programs did not worry about getting the students on the page like they used to, David. Yeah, no. The other thing is, is that the affect side, the cognitive science, it was really clearly that we only pay attention to things that we're interested in. The dimension of our interest is really critical to giving us the cognitive focus it takes to do the work that's involved in learning to read. We cannot just say we're going to do this absent that kind of engaging interest um, you know, material that the children can kind of you know, ski up on into. So it takes both. Well, for sure. And, and also, I think that in the field of reading, the focus has been so much on decoding. And that's because you can see when Johnny looks at um, Steam and says stream, the problem is obvious. He's added an R or he's got a phoneme awareness, whatever. He's, he can't decode. But when Johnny has the comprehension problem is much more difficult to see. Johnny just, look, just looks like he's not paying attention, or he's not as bright as. And so the field of reading has really skewed itself over here to decoding, and it's just trying to make its way back to comprehension. And what I'm hoping is that we can see that it's a two-sided coin yeah, often, and there they are. Yeah. But we, it's really hard to get people interested in doing fMRI research on what are the correlates for your brain processing, your uh, processing when you're comprehending. Yeah, I'm not so sure that uh, currently, anyway, the fMRIs can teach us what we need to know. Uh, I, I had a. I don't. I don't want you to put me on tape about this, but I don't think that we know the right questions to ask yet of the brain. I, I fear had, that. I had a conversation with uh, you probably won't be on anything, but uh, um, Sally Shavitz. Yeah. And uh, I asked her, well. What kind of uh, frequency variation can you see and correlate? You know, right now, all they can really see, uh, the analogy that I use is it's like a satellite looking at the United States. And yeah, can say, well, that's right. Houston's not as bright as Los Angeles. I know, that's right. But it's the Federal Express traffic yeah. moving packages of information back and forth that's regulating oh. what's important, not just how bright Houston is compared to LA. Yeah. So we still haven't gotten to a point where our. I, I agree with you. I completely agree. I completely agree with you. That could tell us what's really going on, and yet people are off mining. Exactly. The snapshot of how to interpret. That's them. exactly right. My mother used to say that everyone's wrapped up in their own ball of yarn, and here's what I see in our field. Don't put this in the tape either. People get hooked on their ball of yarn, and then that's what they talk about, and they make it work for them yeah. instead of kind of looking at a broader view, and then, as you're saying, be more definitive and what they're asking the brain to do. I, I'm really concerned that, that some of the, even the tasks that they're asking the brain to do do not get at the uh, significant issues no, of reading. They're, they're, they're uh, artifacts of what we can measure, how we can yeah. turn our measurement equipment yeah. into telling us something more. That it's, uh, um, you mentioned earlier um, 
the sensory component of comprehension. Yeah. We were talking about. That. Yeah. Take me into what you mean specifically. I mean, clearly, you're talking about the kind of uh, creative visualization. How is it that this uh, dynamic awareness symbol system relates to uh, getting the meaning of a word, and then all of those things combining to create some kind of a image? Where is the sensory part of this, other than the virtual visual? I think that um, sensory is the, your ability to image, just to be real straightforward. I think that imagery ability happens in your sensory system, just like phonemes happen in your sensory system. Okay, so it's, a, it's the virtualized visual system. Right, sensory that's sensory right. System, visual and, imagination. That's right, and here's what we have found. Um, there are individual differences in the ability to visualize either fast or in gestalts. The biggest thing that we have found, and it's difficult to measure, is people with a comprehension problem have difficulty visualizing the whole. So, and I think it has something to do with the speed of their processing. So the language comes in, either they read it or it comes in orally. And I think that their sensory system, their ability to visualize, doesn't happen fast enough so they get apart. So they pick up on a, the name of someone or the date. But what they can't do is bring parts to whole in the form of images. Like I do it automatically and, and just never had any trouble with that. But I, I can talk with someone and, or go to the movie, I'll give you an example, go to the movie with someone that has this comprehension problem and they will have missed the big picture of the movie. They won't like it for whatever reason they've gotten a, a bit or a piece of it. So the critical piece here is you're not saying this is reading particular, this is processing general. Exactly. This is, this is a cognitive function, I think, that's absolutely necessary for reading comprehension and listening comprehension, both. Good, good. That is a really important issue. Yeah, it is. This isn't just a, a reading thing. Yeah. Now, how does this connect to, to the learning style theorists who have been for 25 years talking about the different biases of processing yeah. that only some small subset are visual processors as opposed to auditory or acoustical? Pat and I don't buy the learning styles theory. I'm not saying that there isn't such a thing as someone have a pro having a propensity to be visual or having a propensity to be auditory. The, the issue for us is that in order to be an independent, self-correcting, cognitive learner, they have to do it all. So I can't say, well, David really likes to do visual, so I'll do everything visual. And then what's going to happen is in my circles, my Venn diagram, David's maybe only going to have one thing developed. It's really important, in my opinion, that an individual is taught to um, use all of the sensory information that they have available, and there's no reason that they can't. I can teach someone to visualize concepts. I can teach someone to feel sounds and hear sounds. I can teach someone to be able to see letters. It's just a matter of directing uh, the, the questioning toward that. So I don't think it's OK to say, well, doesn't doesn't use it, so let it go. Yeah, I, I have, I have uh, Don't Don't put that on I'm, either, OK? Right. Well, I'm on record in my stuff of being quite an argument with learning stuff theory in general. It's, that's so another what, example, what David, of how people pick up on something and won't let it go. Yeah, they're the format system, or this system, or this system, and yeah. we're just nuts with it. Yeah. Um, rather than um, differentiating and, disambig and disambiguating the living edge of whatever it is somebody's doing, which may involve uh, any number of yeah blends of sensory yeah. participation in yeah. order to make it appropriate for that individual. Um, having said that, while I don't think that any of their mechanized ways of responding to their profiling, which is an artificial thing, not the real person, um, there does seem to be some evidence for the propensity to process in a, with a bias. I, I think, without, that, without I think saying, that's oh, right. We should do it. No, I think that's right. Propensity to process with mm -hmm. a bias. And then you could say, well, we should work counter to that in order to stretch more dimensions mm -hmm. and, and cross more senses. Mm -hmm. But if we just stay, stay right there and say that some people have a propensity or a bias to process in a particular way, how does that uh, bias spread difference relate to what you were saying before about the uh, imagination? Um, there's, there's a connection there. I, I don't. I, I guess the best way for me to, to explain it is to 
is to say that how I think about it is that if there's a bias, it probably doesn't matter as much as that I can say to myself, I know that David has difficulty with concept imagery, but I know that he's going to do well with symbol imagery or whatever, and I'm going to develop that a little bit. I'm probably not going to use your symbol imagery, which is what the learning styles people do say. They'll say, use his strength to develop something. I'm probably just going to go right after developing your concept imagery. So I don't think that the bias matters so much. Do you know, do you see what I'm saying? It, it, what I need to do is identify what you need. And then I just need to teach it. And if you have a strength over here, that's fine. But I am absolutely going to bring all of your processing um, at a workable level. I'm not just going to say, well, I'm not going to work on these and, and I'm going to do these. Um, I, I guess I also think that, well, enough said. Learning styles are, it, it's a cop out. David, it's a cop-out. I, I think it is, too. I use a particular model, which I call co-implication, mm. where, where all these things are implicating one another mm -hmm. in this deep, integrating experience, whatever it may be, the very mm -hmm. nature of whatever mm -hmm. we're differentiating mm -hmm. and extending into. So, and I've always thought learning styles were crude mechanical approximations made for the convenience of observers. Do you know what uh, NLP is? Yes. All right. They, I think the, the one valid thing that they said is that I'm for sure visual when they when you look at NLP. I'm I'm visual. I see. I say to you, I see what you're saying. I think fast. I'm fast about everything I do. I'm processing fast. We have people that are auditory, and they'll say, I hear what you're saying. And we have people that oh, I I can I can get into that. So that's more feeling thing. The the one valid thing that I think that they had to say was in treatment in working with a student. And um, I'm going to try to get you balanced on all the sensory processing, your symbol imagery, concept imagery, your phoneme awareness, your, um, the whole, all the Venn diagram. But I think if I can read you as more of the kinesthetic person, I can adapt myself down a little bit so I have better um, rapport with you. And I think that was a valid thing that they brought to the table. People don't talk about that. They've written it off as, I think they have anyhow, yeah, Santa Cruz. Master NLP uh, trainer. So you what? One of my best friends. Is yeah, a but I think, but that's, but that's a good thing for us to be able to say to our clinicians, you've got David and he's thinking fast and doing fast. You get to be with him, you know, get him or get him on the floor, or stand him up, whatever. Meet him on the edge or whatever. Exactly. Whatever he is. In yeah, the process of and his we definitely try to do that. And I think NLP brought that to, right. to the field. Which goes all the way back to what we were talking about, trying to help somebody stretch out what they're hearing, yeah. or what they're seeing, or what they're right. feeling, or mm -hmm. it, it, which. Which all of that folds back to, isn't it interesting that that's what the baby's doing? And yeah. it extends into being able yeah. to walk or <laughs> right. to being able to right. manipulate a fine object or differentiate right. uh, voices. Excellent. Um, I could talk to you a little bit about autism. Please. Whenever I'm making a presentation and I start with the dyslexic over here and I draw a head that's the side profile and then a full view of like a hyperlexic. So I can talk about the two-sided coin. The students have trouble reading words and the students that have trouble comprehending. And I can put the Venn diagram in the middle. Well, this label could be dyslexia. But if you go on the spectrum, what I call a language processing spectrum, this student over here has difficulty um, decoding the word. They're the steam stream student. This student over here can decode anything. Decoding's way above, spelling's way above, but their comprehension's way down here. Like I've seen students that have uh, 99th percentile in paragraph accuracy, reading accuracy, first percentile in comprehension, vocabulary 99th percentile. So it has nothing to do with understand the meaning of the word or decoding the word. It's purely something to do with them not being able to comprehend. So you can take it and let the label of dyslexia to hyperlexia. If you keep going, now you have run into the autistic spectrum. Because those students primarily have trouble, primarily have trouble with comprehension, whether it's reading comprehension or lang oral language comprehension. comprehension. So I so often when I make a presentation, David, I, I'm trying to, to get people to see that 
reading is not just one thing, but it's also not 15,000 things either. It's on a spectrum. And so you have dyslexia over here. And of course, that can be mild, moderate, severe. Can be to do with phonemes, as Sally Shaywitz would say. It can be that's also connected to symbol imagery. Those things are highly correlated. But if you keep going over here, you can have the student that has the comprehension problem. Again, that can be mild, moderate, severe. I can work with students that have a mild comprehension problem. So we can work, teach them to visualize within two or three weeks, four hours a day, sometimes less than that. Or they can get severe. When they get severe, now the label of hyperlexia can begin to apply. And if they get really severe, and maybe it's affecting their social situation, then all of a sudden they're on the autistic spectrum, and that can be mild, moderate, or severe. And I guess it helps me when I'm teaching workshops and training our staff here to give them the big picture. I'm, I'm the big picture person that once you have that, then you can diagnose accurately. If you don't have the right big picture or a big picture that in, includes all these pieces, then you start doing this thing of reacting to a part and seeing everything is one piece, like phoneme awareness is now. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I, you deal, you said earlier you had a thousand employees. How many, how many students per year do you deal with? Do you, do you in clinics, um, it ranges between 900 to 1,500. In our centers, we have 39 centers. Collectively, your whole organization. When, but we have school projects all over, so it's thousands. It's uh, probably between 10 and 20, 15,000 students. That, and that's not even counting the teachers that have had our workshops. That, that, are, that are practicing your workshops yeah. in their classrooms. Yeah. Up. Yeah. Yeah. Activity, yeah. You know, can I just have to add, we would never have this had I not spent a lot of time building an infrastructure. No, I, I mean, I'm, I'm not, I, I am not kidding you. It's yeah. people underestimate the importance of management structures for something like this. This is a big endeavor. We would never have been able to make a difference. Yeah, for whatever it's worth, I could tell that on the phone. I could tell that since I've gotten here. That yeah. There, that there's quite a... Um, Organizational yeah. intelligence. I yeah, think. thank it's, you. It's separate thank from you. the uh, good work about learning. Thank you. That's and right. That they're, that they're both learning projects that are That's related right. together. In That's what right. That's right. Yeah. We would never be able to do the research. And we, um, Pat and Phyllis and I, put our money back into we don't take money out. Uh, it's much lower salaries than most organizations, certainly, probably lower than most people that are in. Uh, the field of academia and, and nonprofit places, and we put that money back into being able to do research. Yeah. So you're the one that really runs the business. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. Some. yeah. But can we not put that on tape too? Huh? Let's not put that on tape. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. I just want to acknowledge that. As Thank you. Team Appreciate team it. Um, we were talking about the spectrum. One of the things that's a big confusion out there is this difference between basic and proficiency as it's set up and yeah. measured out there. And a lot of people that I talk to, I try to bring out that difference because it, there's some correspondence to what you're saying, although the system doesn't map over you know, uh, incredibly well, that with basic we're talking about a kind of an instrumental ability that I could read the label on a bottle, I could yeah. read, I can work out a word and recognize yeah. a word, but the overall process is so inefficient but it's not something that I'm going to be drawn to as a to, to be involved in anything more than I absolutely have to. Yeah, you probably aren't going to be a lifelong learner. Well, certainly not a lifelong learner through the media right. of that kind, right? right. I mean, be lifelong as other people have been artistically mm -hmm. or uh, sports or otherwise mm -hmm. intuitive geniuses right. in their mm -hmm. learning. But all that goes with reading, all of the self-reflective, abstractive, extensional right. mm -hmm. processes mm -hmm. that come in through the exercise mm -hmm. called reading, they're not mm -hmm. going to have access. Right. Um, so there's this basic level and this proficiency level. And the proficiency level is that all of this is, is rather than just having this kind of instrumental functionality, it's functioning at such an efficient level that the reading has become as transparent as listening. Yeah. That I, can, I can read and get it just as easy as I can yeah. listen to you and get it. There's no real yeah. distinction anymore. That's right. Simple. That's right. exactly that's right. That's when I cross the line into becoming proficient that's and right. excellent and so forth. Right. And so the basic thing, if we don't have the, the, the uh, phonemic awareness piece working, if we don't know the letter-sound combinations, we can't get to that level. 
If we don't you mean even to the basic level? Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. If we don't have sufficient vocabulary, then, right. we, then, then we're working on something that's an alien thing. When right. it finally does pop, we right. can't tell whether it's the right thing or the wrong thing because right. we have no inner reference for it. Right. So we get the vocabulary, we got this virtual assembly working, sounds and letters, boom. Well, this is working too slow. And right. as you say, it's not producing this, aha, I get it, in the street. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Back to the Venn diagram. Yes. Word attack, word recognition, contextual reading, vocabulary, all of it surrounded by comprehension. That's that's how the that's why the Venn diagram is so helpful. If you want to put it in terms of basic versus proficiency, we can take a student and if now you have to visualize that this is the word attack circle and this is the word recognition, here's the context, right. here's all of here's the whole thing around that means comprehension. At a at a basic level, and that was part of my concern, you could develop their phoneme awareness, their symbol imagery, which is what we do now. We do the two things at the same time, and develop their word attack skills. But unless you get over here to filling in all the circles, you are not you are not going to reach proficiency. And that is, that is my big concern. That's why the Venn diagram works so well. I can talk to a student, David, and say, here's where we are. And I put the Venn diagram out there, and I say word attack, word recognition, uh, paragraph stories and then around it comprehension. Here's where we are. We've got this circle filled in and I'll fill it in and so I just have a little bit of it left. And this circle's about partially filled in. This one we're still working on. So now we're going to shift what we do and we're going to do more over here. So I'm going to be doing more work with symbol imagery, more work with multisyllable, more work with reading on the page. And all of that we're going to bring together and I'm going to ask you to visualize for the whole. And and then I can get the student to see the difference between basic, which would be over here sounds and letters and applying some uh, to the syllable structure from simple to complex, to actually moving over here and memorizing words and uh, reading in context. And so I can talk about what you're saying, basic and proficiency. I can talk to him with a Venn diagram. Right. I can I fill him in. Try to pull this in because so much of our system thinks in those terms. Yeah. And I mean, I, I had a conversation with the, uh, the lead consultant to the Senate of California on this matter, and their general attitude is, well, proficient doesn't matter. We're just focused on basic. We're going to bring up the, the basic. And yeah, I, see, that is, that that, is crazy. That's because they throw out NAEP, right? That is being crazy. irrelevant except for the basic one. To me, it's like basics, uh, the whole thing is about anybody that's, that's less than proficient is being harmed by this by the process of learning to read. Mm -hmm. they're, actually, they're actually being hurt. But, but, we start to teach somebody to read and they don't get proficient. We've harmed them. Absolutely. The thing is that, that with all the stuff that you're doing and all the conversations you're doing, you've just walked into my world when I was back there getting the master's degree. And that was in the in the late eighties that people are, are wrapped up in their own ball of yarn and they really do get stuck on one piece. And that is dangerous. Because reading is not just one thing. I mean, then they were stuck on use of context, guessing in context. So, yeah. enough said, I guess. We don't have to flog the horse, but I guess we're flogging it, aren't we? Back to comprehension again, and two questions. One having to do with, you said, okay, there's a lot of kids that are, well, you said there were some kids anyway, I want to quantify this a little bit, percentage-wise, um, that are reading fine in the sense that they can pronounce the word, their vocabulary is high, right? They've yeah. got it, right? Yeah. And yet they're not getting the gestalt, they're not getting yeah. what it all means. Yeah. Let's talk, let's stop right there. When we look at, when I look at the spectrum, or when I talk to people about the spectrum of different kinds of difficulties, that rarely comes up. That doesn't come up enough. Making my point. Okay, good. What's the percentage of that? If you were to say, I mean, there's 35 million kids struggling with this to some degree. How many of them are struggling there as opposed to the deep end of the problem with respect to getting up to sufficient ecology of processing at the basic level to even be able to move on to the level you're describing? I don't think that we have done the research to know, but I would be willing to bet that it's up about 40%. That's what I would be willing to bet. So, uh, so, so that means that those 40% probably can decode well, but can't comprehend. Now, are they mild? Is it severe? I mean, how, sure. how big is the, the problem? But um, until we get really serious about asking... We don't have any to, probes or lenses in there to know right now. I don't think we do. I don't okay. think that we have enough. Okay. And, and again, I think that 
and if you look at it bigger than just reading, and I know your focus is on just reading, but if you ask yourself, kin kindergarten through 12th grade and that pipeline that we put our children through, here's first grade, second grade, third grade, and here's the end, and we've got them in public education, and we have a responsibility, or any private education, we have a responsibility for that. The, the question that, that I struggle with is what we want them to do, be able to do when they get out of 12th grade is not just sound out a word, it's back to basics and proficiency, but it is also to comprehend oral language. Because if you think K through 12, what are they comprehending the most with language, getting meaning from language, that's the only reason to read or listen. It's oral language that's coming at you all the time. It's coming at those little children in first grade, second grade, third grade. It's on the playground, it's in conversation, it's home. It's understanding cause and effect in to, for behavior issues. It's, it's oral language comprehension. Yet we have this big focus on written language uh, and then rarely written language comprehension. But at the end of that pipeline, what will these students do the most with their life? 25% are going to go to um, higher education, so they may be going to get a better chance to learn more about comprehending. Seventy-five percent are going to go to the workplace, and the majority of their time is going to be spent on oral language comprehension. So while I'm really concerned about decoding and reading, I'm also very concerned that we do a better job in diagnosing and um, developing language comprehension in general, David, not just written language. Yeah. And by the way, Children of the Code is about the unnaturalness of just as much as we're, we're biology is, the DNA is in my fingertip. Mm. The, the effect of this code is all around us, the, mm -hmm. our world. Oh, for, absolutely. Creation, right? but, but it's also oral language. I mean, it's it is, everywhere. You know, like the, like the uh, studies have shown, I mean, almost 80% of the common vocabulary in our oral language came from the writing system. Right? Mm. The, or, the mm -hmm. oral language mm -hmm. is a child now. Mm -hmm. you, you have to go and find some tribe that's never been exposed mm -hmm. to a writing system mm -hmm. and then see they don't use generalizations, mm -hmm. they don't talk about yeah. time. They, they live in an yeah. entirely different yeah. linguistic universe You're right. than, than people You're that right. have developed an oral language that's then been folded right. and affected by right. a written language, and the written language changes how they use oral language, yeah. both at the vocabulary level and at the metalinguistic level. Uh, yeah self-reflective, da 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 right. right? So we're trying to get at that. And <clears throat> at, the, at the ground of it all, it's not about whether people can read or not. That's kind of secondary to us. Mm -hmm. It's that the majority of our children are growing up, and they're, they're being naturally and artificially confused. Mm -hmm. Confused in a way that the human brain did not evolve to cope with. Mm -hmm. And they're feeling like, that confusion is there is something wrong with them. You mean as they as they learn to break the code? Is yeah, that what you mean? Well, I, I don't like the term break as if oh. it's a singular event. But yes. No right. Yeah, the the, the, the the kind of confusion that goes with processing the multi level ambiguities that are in this code <laughs> is a kind of confusion the human brain never experienced <laughs> in nature. It's yeah. unique to this virtual symbol <laughs> processing challenge. Right. And that these children in in experiencing the feeling of that confusion, are developing a uh, a feeling that there's something wrong with yeah, them. They're developing shame. Right. The affect shame is triggering in relation oh. to this confusion, mm -hmm. which is bringing about a shame aversion to the feeling of confusion, which decapitates mm -hmm. learning. Mm -hmm. That's the core of what we're about. Mm -hmm. Good. And well, I hope I contributed something you contributed to it. Contributed a lot. I, love I don't know. Um, Einstein. Oh my gosh, he's my favorite person because he always talks about imagery. Yes, and he, was, he does. Uh, he's a semantic he said, image, image, uh, he, imagery, right? Yeah. He, his, his approach to, to relativity was based on uh, a I have feeling quotes. in his body that he was able to visualize from. He said that if Aristotle said uh, man cannot think without mental representations, I mean, that's, and he's a person of reason, and I think that logic and reason are so important and I and I'm so frustrated when I see people only pick up on a part instead of the whole but um, Einstein said if you can't picture it you can't understand it I mean he did so much of his stuff was done in his head first um, that yeah he's he's one of my favorites is it, it is why are you bringing him up I was using him as an example and somewhat a counter example he's my favorite too my favorite all-time quote is make everything as simple as possible yeah no simpler. 
Yeah. <laughs> that's right. I mean, that's what I was trying to say about the whole Venn diagram. Right. Make it as simple as possible. Well, don't make it just this piece. Like, don't make it simpler than it really is. Right. Exactly. That's my exactly. Favorite. But my understanding, and I had a uh, mutual friend with him. I don't, did you ever encounter something for like physicist David Bohm? No. Uh, I had Tesla. Okay, Tickle, Elke Tesla, yeah. Mm -hmm. He liked Bohm. He wrote that uh, implicate order. He wrote a number. He's oh. a brilliant guy. Um, he was uh, uh, Einstein's uh, favorite student at Princeton. Oh, really? He went on to write the standard Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics that prevailed for 30 years in wow. the universities of the world. Wow. Um, anyway, he, um, the point was, his sense from conversations with Einstein was with respect to relativity theory that he somaticized it. Really? He somaticized really? it. He had a felt sense experience of the relationship in time and space and hmm. what have you. That then he was able to imagine with, hmm. right? That's so I hear, I've heard that mm -hmm. particular thing on a number. Mm -hmm. that in other words, that there's mm -hmm. an acoustical somatic really? uh, r ability to co-implicate or cross-connect mm -hmm. multiple things that don't necessarily they, they become visual, but mm -hmm. they don't start visual. So that's interesting. He also said imagination is more important than knowledge. knowledge. Yeah, yes. yeah, it's great stuff. But the, th the thing is, you can, I, I don't, just for your purposes, you can you can develop someone's imagination. Yeah. That is the exciting thing. I mean, you absolutely can take someone who says, "I can't see a thing," and within four weeks, they can visualize unbelievably. It's, it's fabulous. Now, could we measure their creativity pre and post? We don't have a measurement for it. Yeah, we I mean, to to look at you know somebody like Einstein, but you can develop someone's ability to visualize. There's a great. Um, I hope he puts it into a book that there's a great story of a man who called me from uh, London. And I can't do a British accent, and his name is David. And he probably wouldn't mind David if I gave his last name. But he said, my daughter, can you help me? My, I bought your book, Visualizing and Verbalizing. My daughter seems like one of the students you, that you wrote about. Can you help her? And I said, I'd have to see her. You know, Can you get her over here? And so we got her over here. And she did not dream she was absolutely um, over here in the spectrum. And he kept saying to me, as we saw her for, her for three and a half weeks, and truly she went from the fifth percentile to the, I think, the 80th or the 75th percentile in reading comprehension. And at the end of three weeks, she began to dream. Now, she had not dreamed. And so I was on the BBC, all right? For, she was written about as the girl who couldn't dream and learn to dream. And I kept trying to talk to them in the BBC. They interviewed me one morning. Uh, I kept trying to say, but, but, but really, it's not about dreaming. I'm trying to tell you that this girl couldn't comprehend, that she was lost in conversation. She was lost in conversation at the table. She was lost in conversation at, at school. She, was, she would look like she was not paying attention because she would pick up on a part rather than a whole. And this, this teaching her to visualize was primarily to develop her reading comprehension, her language comprehension. An artifact was that she learned to dream. I could never, she was I mag. I totally get that. So what you're saying is, is that the visualization system is cr creating an integrative framework for everything to, to call implicate or link together through. All they wanted to talk about was how was I able to teach someone to dream? Yeah. You know, it, it was, it was wild. Well, there you go again. They, that's exactly right. The part, the part, the part, the part rather than the whole. Well, this has been a pleasure. I could talk with you for a Yeah, I could too. And uh, I look forward to other occasions of us doing that. I know you got to get going. Is yeah. there anything else that you'd like to add to this? I got the visualization piece. I think the most important thing. <laughs> I, th I think that I had my lips like, like that. Oh, you're coming across great. And oh, let's cold. see, David. I don't know. I, th I think that, uh, I think I probably hit it all. That there, I have a, I should send you a copy of this since you're so interested in this stuff. I have a letter written to me from a pediatrician that I just recently found. Her son, we helped with the LIPS program. He could do the blocks and he could feel the sounds. And honestly, he still couldn't spell and his reading was still not well developed over in word recognition and reading in context. But, but it was the first time, he was 15, it was the first time that he had made any gains at all. And what you're calling basic, he would begin to fill in this word attack circle, but these were all still really in trouble over here. He had no comprehension problems, of course, because it can be a two-sided coin. And I came in and I had him before, this was before I wrote the Scene Stars program, but I had him write letters in the blocks. I said, I want you 
to put letters on there, not just feel the sounds, but I want you to tell me the letters. And he just had so much trouble, I had to go back from five blocks to two. And um, his mother wrote me a letter that, that uh, I'll see if I can find. I came across it, and, and I think you'd like it. She says that David was, I mean, his name was, starts with a J, and I've forgotten his name. I think it's Justin. Always was the person that was chosen throughout school to be on any sort of uh, team for comprehension work because he had fabulous images of Europe and the colonial period. Just and he could do anything; he just couldn't decode. And so after I asked him to put letters on the blocks that day, he came back to his mom, and and this is the important part. Uh, he said, "Mom, now this is a high school student. He had long black hair, very handsome." He said, "Do you see letters and words?" And she said she didn't know what this was about because all she knew was lip hoppers and tip tappers up to that point. And uh, she said, yeah, I do. And he said, I don't see him at all. And she said, David, don't you see even any? And didn't mean give him a word. He said, I don't see anything. And she said that was such an aha experience for her because he had, now she knew why he'd never been able to develop sight words. And you're not going to read fast until you have sight words developed. And she said, what occurred to me was he had all these images of all this stuff, but not one single word was visualized in his head. And I just think that's fascinating. That's fascinating stuff. Also, phoneme awareness was off. And this is, this is going to be very connected to spelling. Yeah, absolutely. Right. This is, I wish I could have what Lisa, Lisa Mosin was saying with you on this point. It's yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Right. Otherwise, we're going to have kids spelling words phonologically. They aren't going to be snapshotting, knowing what letter's in the right place. I remember saying, looking at the word answer, I went to a one-room school. I was alone in my grade. Did I tell you this? I was alone in my grade. The joke is that I was high and low in the eighth grade class. I graduated high and low. But I remember, and we only had 16 kids in our school, and I remember looking, just as if it was yesterday, the board and seeing answer and going, there's a W in that word, you know? And I never forgot it because I could integrate phoneme awareness with symbol imagery. Yeah, and if you can't... That, which, which meant that the one system was operating fast enough it wasn't that's consuming right. all of that's right. just to do that part. That's right. And also, I innately had this ability to see letters and words. My mom used to say, I don't know why we're not doing spelling bees anymore, Nancy. Why are we not doing spelling bees? And I, that was because she was good at it. Because if you watch someone doing spelling bees, their eyes are all up. If I ask you to spell opportunity, well, I don't know. I could probably do that one without looking at it. But pusillanimous, you know, you're probably going to have to reach for something up there. Thanks. Sure.